Welcome to the fourth in our brief series of Bible studies on love and the law. We've seen so far how Jesus said that the greatest commandments are to love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and to love your neighbour as yourself. He said this is basically what all the Old Testament laws are about. And then we saw how Jesus himself lived by these commandments. But we saw in the second study how this sometimes brought him into conflict with those who followed a much more legalistic approach to the laws. Then in the third study we looked at passages from the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus talks about some of the Old Testament commandments and broadens their application. Today I want to go on from Jesus to the early church, in particular to what is generally called the Council of Jerusalem, described in Acts chapter 15. It isn't given that title there, but that's the title we normally give to it. The book of Acts, of course, tells of the development of the early church. At first, it seems it was composed entirely of Jews or of proselytes, that is, Gentiles who had adopted Jewish faith and life. But gradually others were converted. In chapter 8, Philip preaches in Samaria and then is instrumental in the conversion and baptism of the Ethiopian official. In chapter 10, Peter similarly is instrumental in the conversion and baptism of Cornelius, the Roman officer, and his family. However, we don't hear anything further about these conversions, but it's in chapter 11 that we hear of, of events that had long-term implications. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, telling the message to Jews only. But other believers, who were from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and proclaimed the message to Gentiles also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. The church in Jerusalem then dispatched Barnabas, a safe pair of hands, I guess they reckoned he was, uh, to look after this new development in Antioch. He then found Saul, or Paul as we more normally call him, and it says... For a whole year the two met with the people of the church and taught a large group. Interestingly, it also adds it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. So you now have a growing number of non-Jewish Christians. While we're not specifically told in Acts about the lifestyle they were required to lead, yet it seems clear they were not asked to follow all the demands of the Old Testament Jewish law. But then things came to a head. At the start of chapter 15 we read, Some men came from Judea to Antioch and started teaching the believers you cannot be saved unless you are circumcised, as the law of Moses requires. Paul and Barnabas got into a fierce argument with them about this, so it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others in Antioch should go to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this matter. And so we get what is commonly called the Council of Jerusalem, an event that was of huge importance. I think, in fact, it's impossible to exaggerate just how important it was not only for the Church, but also in, in many ways for world history. And yet, I suspect many Christians are hardly aware of the significance of this enormously significant moment. If those men who'd come from Judea had had their way, the Gentile converts would have had to submit to Jewish laws, including the food laws, <coughs> and, uh, and circumcision for the men, and my guess is the church would have stayed as a Jewish sect and would probably have fizzled out. Well, thank God, 
That is not what happened. So Paul and Barnabas went to Jerusalem. They're welcomed on arrival there, but we also read some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and elders of the church then met to thrash this out. We are told there was a long debate, but unfortunately Acts does not record the arguments put forward by the Conservative side. However, I think we can be 100% sure that they would have spoken of circumcision being given to Abraham as the sign of the covenant, and that that is what it had been for all subsequent generations. They might even have commented that Jesus himself was circumcised. And as regards the law of Moses, well, I think we can again be 100% sure they would have said it was given by God as an integral part of the Exodus salvation that, that was at the very root of the nation's life. God had rescued them from Egypt, led them to Mount Sinai, where they were given the law before they entered the promised land. These, they would have argued, were not optional extras to be taken or not taken as people wanted. They were integral. They were requirements. Now, at this point, you could pause to reflect on this. Put yourself in the position of a Christian from a Jewish background. You have been brought up on the scriptures and circumcision and the other demands of the law are clear in those scriptures. Recently, you've become a Christian, acknowledging Jesus as Messiah and Lord and Saviour. And now you've been listening to these arguments from the conservative side. How do you respond? Continuing. Next at the meeting, it's Peter who speaks. He says this, recorded in Acts 15, verses 7 to 11. My friends, you know that a long time ago God chose me from among you to preach the good news to the Gentiles, so that they could hear and believe. And God, who knows the thoughts of everyone, showed his approval of the Gentiles by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he had to us. Presumably here he is referring to the conversion of Cornelius. He continues, He made no difference between us and them. He forgave their sins because they believed. So then, why do you now want to put God to the test by laying a load on the backs of the believers, which neither our ancestors nor we ourselves were able to carry? No. We believe and are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they are. So Peter says that what has happened in the conversion of many Gentiles is of God, and that these Gentile converts should not be burdened by the requirements of the law. Jesus himself had spoken of the law as being burdensome, Referring to the yoke of the law, he said in words recorded in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all of you who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it on you, and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest. And he had complained of the Pharisees and teachers of the law that... They tie onto people's backs loads that are heavy and hard to carry, yet they aren't willing even to lift a finger to help them carry those loads. And we've seen in our studies how Jesus put love and care for people above legalistic application of the law of Moses. So Peter argues against imposing the burden of the Jewish law on the Gentile converts. Paul and Barnabas then backed up what Peter had said by reporting all that God had been doing among the Gentiles in Antioch and elsewhere. 
with the clear implication that the church must see this as the way God was leading his church and that it was vital to be in step with what God was doing, even if it was an enormous change from what had gone before. Again, you could pause at this point and reflect on how you, in this role of being a Jewish Christian who's come to follow Jesus as Messiah, how you would see these arguments. Would they be disturbing, bewildering, a bombshell perhaps, or maybe liberating and exciting? We continue. It was James, the Lord's brother, who had become the leader of the church in Jerusalem, who made the decision. After quoting from Amos, the prophet Amos, to show that the bringing in of Gentiles was indeed to be expected and seen as God's work, he gave his opinion. That we should not trouble the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write a letter telling them not to eat any food that is ritually unclean because it has been offered to idols, to keep themselves from sexual immorality, and not to eat any animal that has been strangled or any blood. The letter was sent to the church at Antioch and other churches carried by two trusted believers, and the heart of the letter says this. We send you then Judas and Silas, who will tell you in person the same things we are writing. The Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to put any other burden on you besides these necessary rules. Eat no food that has been offered to idols. Eat no blood. Eat no animal that has been strangled. And keep yourselves from sexual immorality. You will, be do, you will do well if you take care not to do these things. What a relief this must have been for the Gentile converts. Yes, they were being asked to make some compromises, such as not eating meat with blood, which of course is not something we take any notice of today. But they were not required to be subject to the full demands, the burden of the law of Moses, and circumcision was not required. The door then was open to the expansion of the church. A final pause here for reflection. But this time, take the role of a Gentile who has become a Christian at Antioch. You have been deeply disturbed by the group who came from Judea making those demands. Now that is set aside and you feel a huge sense of relief. But you also know that uh, in becoming a follower of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, you acknowledge the Old Testament scriptures and you see that there is much in the law that is good. So do you find yourself wondering how all this fits together? And the final part of this reflection back as yourself now. What do you feel? you have gained from the decision made at the Council of Jerusalem. Well, that's enough for this study. Next time we will take a brief look at how Paul, in his letters, helps us to see how some of these things fit together, how the laws are important but how God's grace and love is supreme. But let's pray now. Lord, we thank you for the liberty that we have as Christians. We give thanks for the momentous decision that was made at the Council of Jerusalem. We give thanks for the way it enabled Jew and Gentile to, hit, to bear the name of Christian and enabled all of us to know we are accepted and loved by God. And as we rejoice in what you have given us, 
help us in the task of sharing with all people the great message of salvation in Jesus, that just as many found faith at Antioch, so many may find faith in Jesus today. Amen. And if you have never really looked at this very significant chapter of the Bible, can I suggest that you do read and reflect further on Acts chapter 15, verses 1 to 35.